Okay, thank you. So I should warn everyone before this presentation is that I'm actually an entomologist, um, but I do have a master um, of science degree in weeds, so I do know a little bit what I'm talking about. And the date of my title of my presentation is Integrated Weed Management Vegetables, Can We Do Away with Tillage? This is a presentation outline. I'll have an introduction. I'll talk about tillage and weed management. I'll talk about challenge of managing weeds and no-till vegetables. I'll present some integrated weed management tools and tactics. Then I'll present some information from a conservation tillage weed study. And then I'll talk about some future research as well as future research needs. So I start off with a definition of weeds. And what are weeds? Weeds are plants that possess adaptive features, which allows them to evade and reproduce in the crop. All right, yeah, put the, other. the most important part of this definition is adaptive feature. Everyone remember the old school definition of weeds? <coughs> weeds was a plant out of place. People say if you have a corn plant in a soybean field, that corn is a corn plant is a weed. I tend to disagree with weed. Um, corn in a soybean field is a mistake. It's an accident. It's not a weed. <laughs> it doesn't have adaptive features. So it didn't invade that field, it was, it was put in that field. Corn left over from the previous season. So we think about the central goal of weed management is to reduce weed competition and reproduction to a level that farmers can accept. We know that farmers have different levels, different tolerance level. You go visit organic farmers, his field may be weed. And he say, this isn't bad. And then you have some, the other, Goal of weed is to stop the production of weed seeds and propagules that may cause problems in future weed plants. And this is what differentiates weed control from weed management. Weed control is basically you have a weed to show up in your field and you try to suppress that weed, get rid of that weed. Weed management is a little bit different. You're thinking about future weed problems. You're thinking about those weeds that have those adaptive features. What can I do to prevent those weeds from invading my field? You're trying to attack the weak links of those particular weeds. And that's what weed management is all about. So we think about that many vegetable producers rely heavily on tillage or size for management of the weed. The single management approach. The problem with that is that you, you, you don't want to do that single management approach. Is it possible to get this off the screen? Okay. That weed management programs rely on a single tax away, like that they may allow weeds to proliferate in the field. And also, it goes against the principle of integrated weed management. So what is integrated weed oh. management? Well, integrated weed management. We'll get both of them to work. All right. Practice of weed management. The whole idea is that you want to make that field environment as uncomfortable to, uncomfortable to those weeds as possible. And the way to do that is throw a lot of weapons at those weeds. You want to diversify those weed management tactics. Areas than we are. Tactics of managing weeds. Now we know that NRCS, what are they promoting? They're promoting reduced tillage. They're promoting no tillage. And the aim behind that is that tillage that limits the amount of eruption to the soil, such as no till and strip till, it should allow healthier soil. And we're talking about healthy soil. Now, soil health and soil quality are not the same. For soil quality, we're talking about physical and chemical properties. Of the soil. soil health, we're talking about those organisms below the soil. You want to keep that, those organisms diverse. And tillage is not, it's not the right thing for those. It's not congenial for them to live. You think about those free-living nematodes below the soil. These are the ones that recycle nutrients and make it available to the plant. Tillage is very disruptive to these organisms. It's like a natural disaster to them, tillage. It's like a hurricane, tsunami, all those bad things thrown into one. That's what tillage. So that's why NRCS is promoting reduced tillage or no tillage. There's some additional tillage pitfalls. The efficacy, dependent on ideal soil conditions. If the soil is wet, you can't go out there and till that field. Uses large amount of fossil fuel. People are concerned about greenhouse gas emissions. But also, if you, use, if you have to go in there and tillage a lot, it's also increasing the cost of production. Enhanced soil erosion. Number four, it causes new weed flushes. Every time you go in there and till, it stirs that soil seabed again. So what's going to happen? Another weed flush is coming up. Also, weeds within the crop row may escape cultivation. Sometimes tillage, cultivation does a very good job of controlling those weeds between the crop rows. But what, what about the weeds within that crop row? On a mat. Without destroying the crop. And then also, cultivation following crop emergence is not possible with high-density crops. If you have a high-density vegetable plant, 
you can't go in there and cultivate. Serve. So the idea between conservation and tillage is it offers many benefits. It takes away some of those pitfalls that come along with tillage. But the major concession to that, if you adopt these practices, you get away from tillage, then you just lost the weed management tool because tillage is a legitimate weed management tool. And important research needs, of course, is finding efficient alternatives to tillage that can be totally part of an integrated weed management program. And you notice I highlight here alternatives. Man. That's the key. Because we're not trying Sorry. to replace tillage. We don't want to replace tillage. There's a need for tillage. So we want to find alternatives. Because again, we want a number of tools in that toolbox that we can use. So because of that, there's yeah, sort of research going on. We know that no tillage with respect to marked off of crops is down packed. Years um, of research. They've done a good job there. But how much do you hear about no-till vegetables? Not a whole lot. There's not a lot of there is some going research, but the adoption rate is low. And the reason is there's not enough research to show that it works well, so farmers aren't confident, and I don't blame in adopting no-tillage vegetables. Also, no tillage recommendations are zero. Alone for weed suppressants, extremely challenging. You're not going to control weeds if you go out there and you just rely on no till. They are doing research along with using cover crop residue, along with no my little, and they're having some success. Some success. One of the biggest problems, though, in no till situation is, especially if you do some those warm season vegetables, is those warm season vegetables like that warm soil. All that cover crop residue on that, or any plant residue, what does that mean? That soil is going to be cooler in the spring. If it's cooler in the spring, you plant those warm season crops, they're just going to sit there. They don't want to grow. It's too cold. But the weeds, there's some weeds that would like that cool weather. They may come up. So that's one of the challenges. So you get reduced yields. They've seen this in crops like tomatoes, peppers, summer squash. What's really challenged is small seeded vegetables. Small seeded vegetables, they don't like no-till situation. Carrots, they don't like no-till situation. They don't do well. The marketability is going to be awful. Of the so now, samples. These and then there's what I do want you to think. Or you can sit here, you can yell at farmers, you have to adopt no-till. But farmers are going to tell you many reasons why they don't want to adopt no-till. One is what I talked about. They want that warmed up in the spring, especially those ones who want to get that crop out there early. So they can hit the market first when that value is high. They can't do that if that soil is too cold. Second, some of them are growing these cover crops, legumes. They need to till it under so they can get the nutritional benefits to their crop. Some of them work with raised beds. No till is not compatible with raised beds. Some they say my soil is compacted or I want to loosen up my soil. You can't loosen up that soil under no till conditions. And then of course, valuable tool for Managing weeds. Theta and compared it to my. So then it come along strip tillage. Fact, consider strip tillage are not a good strip place to the hybrid between conventional and some that were alive. Because you're only tilling a small strip where you're going to plant that vegetable crop. Then the rest of that <coughs> land is what? Left undisturbed. Just like no till condition. Or above. And the tillage is limited to that entry row area where you're going to plant the vegetable. The inner row areas remain undisturbed. They found some of the similar benefits you get with no-till. There's a reducing fuel and labor costs. The other thing they found, most important, is that those yields, you don't get that yield drag. The yield on the script till is similar or something doesn't have other than you can till. And they've seen this with crops such as beans, cucumber, summer squash, winter cross, winter squash, broccoli, sweet corn. Look at here. Small seeded vegetables. Small seeded vegetables do well on the strip till situation. Again, because you're tilling them where you're going to plant that crop. So it's no different from flooding down from the perspective of a vegetable plant. Yeah. So now let's go back to these farmers. Now we're telling these farmers to adopt strip till. Now we can remove some of those arguments. They say, no, I need to warm that soil in the spring. It's going to happen on the strip till because again, you're tilling that where you're going to plant that vegetable. So you allow that soil to warm up. From you can eliminate that problem. How about the one who said, hey, still, I want to till it under so that I can get that nutritional benefit from my cover crop. I'm going to do that with strip till because it's going to be right in that row where you plant the vegetable crop. So that can happen. 
Some want to soften up that soil. Well, they probably only need to soften up that soil where they're going to plant their vegetables, where they're going to plant that crop. So we eliminate that one. Now we have one. Hey, I need those raised beds. That's a problem. You're not going to get raised beds with strip till. That's not going to happen. But there's another technique called ridge even if it's stretched. Ridge till is that you can get that raised bed and you can still leave that residue there. Be the way to raise bed. So maybe we can make him happy. But here we got one left. I use the kill MP problem. A or I'm not going to use strip till to kill weeds. Once you put down that strip, that's it. So that's a problem there. But what I would tell this farmer is, yeah, all this. you can stick with that tillage, but I would go back to the definition of integrated weed management. No matter what tillage you use, what tillage you decide to use, was it? you still have to think about use an integrated weed management approach. You have to use all the tools out there because again, those weeds are, have those adapted features and they're going to make their way in their field unless you throw a lot of weapons at them. So let's talk about weed management for a moment. Remember I said management is different than weed control. Weed control is basically you say, okay, that's a weed in my field. I got to control it. Weed management is all about prevention also. Some of the things we, some of this stuff is common knowledge. Site selection, very important. We know agronomical crops compete very well, compete much. Sulfur. In vegetable crops, site selection is very important for that reason. Generally, the rule of thumb is if you have a field and it's worked with perennial weeds, you don't plant vegetable crops in that field. Well, that you get those perennial weeds under control. Another thing they typically recommend because vegetable crops don't compete well is you should have at least a two-year period, at least two years or two seasons past where you have good weed control before you consider planting a vegetable crop into that field. Crop selection is very important. You know you have different cultivars. Some cultivars compete much better than others. Some cultivars grow better in certain conditions than others. So you want to grow the crop cultivar that grows best for those conditions. An ideal situation is a cultivar that grows tall and has a nice little leaf span because it's going to shade out weeds. Crop pattern is very important. We know crop pattern is important for field crops. We think about soybeans. Soybeans, you can go with wide rows in 36, 30, and then you can drill it. What happens when you drill the soybeans you plant at 7 inch row spacing? That canopy closes much faster so it competes much better against weeds. So in some instances, you can play around with row spacing and vegetables. Some instances you can't, some you can. If you can squeeze more plants into a row or you can tighten up that row spacing, that canopy is going to build up faster. You're going to get better weed suppression. Beans, for instance. You think of things like lima beans, snap beans, where you can close it in. You can put more seeds in a row. What happens when you put more seeds in a row? There's less niche spaces for weeds to germinate. So sometimes you can play around with row spacing and planting and seed, seeding rate in vegetables. Planting date is very important. We know we have some warm season crops, cool season crops, warm season. They don't do very well. Early spring, they might just kind of sit there. So in those conditions, if you can get away with whip farm, maybe you can get in, control the weeds a little bit before you put that crop in, allow that soil to warm up, and then it'll do, do better against the weeds that are coming up um, later in the season. And then we have crop health, vigor, fertility, and all this is about is keeping that plant as healthy as possible. You have some crops that do a pretty good job at competing against weeds. But what happens if you throw in additional stress on that crop? That crop is dealing with a plant disease or is dealing with an insect infestation. It's going to weaken the competitiveness of that crop. So you want to make sure that you take control of these additional stresses so that it can compete well against weeds. Nutrient placement. Notice sand and Feed the, don't feed the weeds. What happens when you broadcast that fertilizer onto the field? We're cleaning it. Yeah, the crop is getting something, but who's getting the rest of that? Weeds. Not only that, you have some weeds that are dormant. They're not going to germinate. They're just going to sit there. But you know what would take them out of that dormancy? Fertilizer. Fertilizer will sometimes kick those weeds out of that dormancy and they'll start germinating. So the idea is if you can ban that fertilizer and apply it to that crop when, it's gonna, when it needs it, when it's going to actually uptake it, you hopefully that the crop is the only thing that's getting that fertilizer and you're not fertilizing the weeds. And then plant technique. And basically that means it's the difference between direct seed versus transplant. You know, if you transplant, you reduce that critical weed-free period. You know what I mean by critical weed-free period? That's the amount of time that you have to keep that, keep those weeds managing that field before you get a yield loss. 
now if you direct seed, it means that such a longer period of time that you have to be concerned with managing those weeds. It normally starts early and it ends later in the season. And that's a downfall to that though. Uh, sometimes transplanting is more expensive than direct seed. So you have to take in consideration the cost and, and determine if it's worth it. Then we have crop rotation. Crop rotation is the cornerstone of any pest management program you, you, you conduct. Whether it's dealing with insulfur or it's dealing with nematode, this should be the number one priority. Now, when we talk about weed control, it becomes a little bit more difficult, a little bit more intrinsic. So it's, it's more about not planting the same crop in the same field year after year. We know about that. But then there's other things that follow here. One, again, you remember when I said that definition of adapted features? So you want to throw things, throwing things out there so that the weeds don't become comfortable. If they, if they start to become comfortable, they take advantage of a niche. So you want to keep changing things up so the weeds don't get comfortable in the field. So one is to alternate crops with different types of vegetation. You know you have leafy crops, right? You have leafy crops such as lettuce. You have bulb crops such as onions. Is that wrong? Is that You have fruit crops such as zucchini, tomatoes. And then you have tuber crops such as potatoes. So you want to make sure that all of those crops are going into that rotation so the weeds are having to deal with something different every year so they don't get comfortable. Alternate grapes. Some people recommend something like maize with vegetable. Alternate different crop cycles. I talked about warm season crops. I talked about cool season crops, and there's some in between. You want to keep all those into the rotation, keep changing up that system. But you want to definitely avoid the seeding crops of the same family. Because typically if crops are of the same family, you typically treat them the same. So you can, some weeds are taking advantage of that niche, that the, that the crops are being treated the same year after year. Then you want to alternate poor and high weed competitors. If you have a clean field, and you say, well, you know, I'm going to plant my weekly competitive crop in this field because it's clean. In certain years, you want to go in and put a more competitive crop in there. Otherwise, you can especially vanish it up after a while and build up. Also, problematic weeds and specific crops. You have some weeds that simply do very well with certain crop and system. You take a solanaceous weed. A solanaceous weed is probably going to do very well with a tomato crop. The reason is the resources they require are identical. Sometimes the weed, the same fertilizer you're using, the same moisture you're applying, all the things you're doing to try to get that tomato crop to grow well, it's the same thing that particular weed needs. And sometimes that weed would take better advantage of. So if you know you have a weed that is always associated with this particular crop, you want to rotate in a different crop that has different requirements than that weed until you can get that weed under control in that field. Also, you want to avoid sort of light weed management practice. What does this mean? That even if you have that are totally different, they're completely different, different plant family, different requirement, but if you're using the same management practice year after year, for instance, year after year, you're going to have some weeds, one, two, or three species of weeds to take advantage of that and proliferate in that field. The thing is, you don't want to allow a single species of weeds to proliferate in that field because every year, every year it builds up, it becomes much harder to, to manage it. So here I, I sort of came up with a crop rotation scheme, sort of taking in all these rules. Now I don't want anyone to write this down and say, hey, hey you can use this, it's going to work. This is, this is just kind of taking in consideration this rule. The reason is any crop rotation scheme you come up with, it can seem very good on the surface. But you want to keep revisiting it. You want to look and see what weeds to make sure that no weeds are beating that system. So here I started out with peas. And peas is a leafy crop. It's a good competitor. It's a cool season crop, so it does well. Then I follow that up with squash. Squash is a fruit crop, so not peas. And it's a poor competitor. The rotation is in crop. Then I come with potatoes. So potatoes is different than both peas and squash in that it's a tuber crop, but it's also a good competitor. Then I can throw in cabbage, a leafy crop, cool season crop, very good competitor against weeds. Now I follow that up with sweet corn. Now I come to the monocot. Sweet corn is a monocot, different than everything I planted before, but it's also a poor competitor. But also, but I followed it up with two good competitors, so maybe now I can sneak in that poor competitive crop. Now the one thing that's missing from this crop rotation scheme is what? There's no agronomical crop there. 
you should throw that in there. Or to your agronomic crops, you definitely want to throw that in there. Because the kind of your crop rotation scheme is not working and weeds are building up, you may want to throw in going with a corn, soybean or soybean corn rotation, or maybe even throw in wheat. To clean those weeds up and then you go back into your vegetable. Two. I mean with your vegetable planting. And then there's a lot of other stuff that's cultural stuff. Mulching, organic mulching, black plastic mulch. Organic mulch is a little bit tricky. The tricky thing with this is this residue, how thick do I need to make that residue? I guess the general rule of thumb, if you're working with something like a hay mulch, typically people say you want it at least an inch and a half thick. If you're working with something like newspaper, then you have to make it even thicker, maybe up to three inches to make sure that you can keep those weeds suppressed. <coughs> Then there's sanitation, machinery, very important. You take your machine in a weed infested field. So that's already firing the weed, the head weed seeds are there. What happens when you take the machine into a clean field? You just throw all those weed seeds into a clean field. The very important so machinery, uncropped areas. These are areas outside the field. You see sometimes but not a single weed. And then all around that field, all of these weeds. They will eventually make their way into that field, so you, you want to clean those up too. Then sometimes people say, happens. Oh, do nothing. When will you do nothing? Whatever. Say it's late in the season, Basically, you already got everything you need out your crop, nothing's going to impact you, but then you see some weeds pop up in that field. Some people say, well, you know, it may be far costly to go out and remove those weeds, just leave them there. And eh, sometimes that's not true. So, Care of 20 feet away. Where you leave two or three plants out there and you get thousands of seeds. You may not want to do that, so you may want to go out there and clean up those weeds in that instance. Then we have biological control. Well, we don't talk about biocontrol a lot when we talk about weeds, but you have some predators, you have some things that's called carabbits that we actually nickname uh, weed predators because that's what they do. They eat weed seeds. So we call them weed seed predators, crickets. Other things are not seeds are born from the pathogens, just like living organisms. Well, I guess we seeds are living organisms anyway, but they're born to bacteria, they're born to fungi. Even if they're on the soil surface, if they don't get moisture at the right time, they're, they're born to desiccation. So there's not a lot of information out there about that, but, but there is some research where people are trying to see how to enhance, enhance these um, seed predators to make them more effective. And then, of course, there's hand removal, hand pulling, hoeing. Uh, you don't do that a lot in these big conventional fields, but you do organic producer use and sometimes to small farmers. And it could be useful in those instances where I say late in your season, you see that nasty weed out there. You may want to go in that field and, and pull it up. And then there's chemical. Of course, chemical is a part of integrated management. But the thing to take in consideration, there's various ways you can use those chemicals. You don't always have to go out and broadcast the whole field, blast the whole field. Sometimes you can spot treat, sometimes you can use bandit sprays. Uh, and there's mechanicals such as mowing, flame cultivation, organic producers using a lot, roller crimper. You don't use roller crimper to suppress weeds, but you use it as part of a weed management program if you're working with cover crops. And then there's companion plant. Companion plant is extremely bad. Your soul, your soul for Basically what we're saying is so two different crops within the same field. So the first question, well, why would you want to do that anyway for weed management? Well, what happens if you put more field, there's less bare, you know, there's less places of tissue exterminate. But it can make weed management a little bit more tricky. And then of course there's cover cropping. And so well, so we got this competing interest involving tillage, soil health, integrated weed management. So the only way to solve this problem is through research success stories and then disseminate those success stories to growers. So with that, I'm going to switch over and talk about a conservation tillage study. So this, this particular study was organic matter. It's actually did the organic ground. It was an egg corn, sweet corn rotation. So right there, you can see a problem with that study. We basically did a rotation with two poorly competitive crops. But that's OK, because we were interested in trying to something test this particular study in the most worst scenario. And the worst scenario is trying to um, do this study on the two poorly competitive crops. So there was three reasons to lower your tissues. Three, maybe. One is to assess the impact. So we used two conservational tillage practices 
and we compare that with two conventional tail practices. And we look at weed capacity and biomass, time spent hand weed, as well as crop yield. So again, there was four treatments here. And the treatment was, here we have our conventional treatments where we had the bare ground and black plastic. And then there was a no-till treatment. And then there was a script till treatment. To the right here, this is what we use. We use this two-row script tiller. And the, this two-row script tiller, the scripts, the width is about 10 inches. This is going to be the width of the rows where we plant the, uh, the vegetable crop, about 10 inches. And then we use the cover crop mixture with scripts and clover, forest rag, as well as rye. So all the treatment plots, all the treatment plots, no matter whether it was conventional or conservation, they were all planted with this cover crop mixture. Uh, this sort of the abbreviation of kind table event. So we start off with our bare ground and black plastic treatment. Basically, we mow that cover crop around April. And then, of course, we had to plow and disc the field to get rid of that cover crop, get rid of that residue. And then the eggplant was planted 24th of May. I'm going to mainly focus on the study, eggplant studies because it was very good. Too much time to go over all that corn results also. Now, we look at no-till. In no-till, we were able to let that cover crop stay out there a little bit longer. And the only thing we needed to do was mow it. Just from... Uh Nothing else. The field needed no other preparation. Mow the cover crop and then plant that eggplant. Script till. Well, we script till it. I'm, I'm sorry. We plant the cover crop. Same mow that cover crop, I should mention. Then we script till it See the it. same day that we plant the eggplant. So one additional step in the script Better. versus no till is that you do script till it. Something with high risk. The data we took on how much weeds were there. And we separate the weeds. We wanted to say how, what kind of impact does treatment have on weeds really? within the crop row and between the crop row. So we see that weed data separately. Other thing we looked at is how much time did it take us to clean up those weeds? So we needed to see how much time you had to do spend cleaning up those weeds in those different treatments. And then there were two areas within each plot where we just allow those weeds to go for maybe a two-month period. And the reason why we did that is the question was, if you had these particular treatment and you don't do any weed management whatsoever, how well would you have those weeds suppressed? Right. And the two was the, the cover crop mixture consists of forest radish, rye, and crimson clover. We know of those winter cover crops, the forest radish is the only one that's going to take off in the fall, so that's what you have in the fall. And then you, that temperature drop for three nights, maybe around 20 or so, basically kills that forest radish. And then by spring, there's no evidence of the forest radish, but you have a nice stand of this crimson clover and rye mix. And then the next step is basically to flare mow all that cover crop in all those plots. And then here is when we start separating the treatment. So in the background treatment below here, again, you basically plow and disc, you remove all that cover crop. Black plastic, same thing, plow and disc, remove all that cover crop. You lay the black plastic, put the eggplant in that black plastic. In no-till, only thing you do, mow that cover crop in the spring, that's it. And then you plant your eggplant or sweet corn. And in the script till plot, basically you have this you till under here where you plant your eggplant, and then this rest of the area remains and uh, So let's talk about weed you can see first. Now, I talked about this weed biomass is from an area that we, are, we didn't do any weed management practices whatsoever. So the eggplant was planted on 24th May, and it was 24th of July when we moved that weeds. So this is in grams per meter square. So basically, you just need to see the difference. So if you look here, you see bare ground here. I have this asterisk here. It's not because there was no weeds in bare ground. Basically, there was a tremendous amount of weeds in the bare ground. They panicked, and they told the farm manager to come in there and till. He actually asked the farm manager to come in there on two occasions. So I didn't think it was fair to show the weed by mass because that was tilled on two occasions. I should also mention the same thing happened. Oops. I should mention also that the same thing happened in the black plastic. There was a rescue tillage treatment in the black plastic. It wasn't weeds popping up underneath the black plastic, but between the black plastic, there was a lot of weeds, so they panicked. They told the farm manager to come out there and please till in between the black plastic. So this isn't a true representation of all the weeds in there. But basically the take-home message is if you look at no-till, 
And then you look in strip-till, basically no-till did the best with suppressing those weeds when we absolutely did no, so, no sort of treatment whatsoever. And the strip-till didn't do very well. All these weeds are basically in that little... Doesn't really... And we skipped to 2014. Now in 2014, they didn't, they didn't panic. They didn't tell the farm manager to go do a rescue treatment. And basically you see here in the bare ground treatment, you see the amount of weeds that are there. And again, the best treatments are the no-till and the black plastic. And look at script till again. Most of those weeds are right in that till script. But the okay. no-till is holding its own. So then we, how much time did it take us to clean up weeds? And I'm not talking about those weedy areas. These were the areas of the field where we weeded on occasion. So here's the data in 2012 and 2014. Again, our treatments to bare ground, black plastic, no-till, script till. So now for 2012, let's just skip to that total column there. And I have that dash there for the bare ground black plastic. That's because that was the year they received the, the rescue treatment, the till. So I didn't think it was fair to compare it there. Although you can kind of look at what happened on 9th, June and July, and you can still see that there was a lot of weeds there, although we had the rescue treatment. But again, the best treatment would, would have been the no-till. And this is in hours per acre. Still a tissue sulfur. The weeds. Look at the script till. Again, okay. very well. So that's 2014. Again, we're looking at total. Now we have a problem. Have you out there? Something happened. Look at this no till. 209 hours per acre of hand weeding, hand weeding, removing those weeds. Very similar to bare ground. For some reason, the no till fell apart Four. in 2014. Yes. Now I'm going to go back to 2013. I said I was going to mainly focus on eggplant, but I want to go back to 2020 because I want to show you that this no-till was well, doing pretty well until 2014. So again, we have our bare ground, black plastic, no-till, strip till. We look at this. Again, this is hours per acre. No-till, 65. Look at bare ground, 290. 95 here in black plastic, 149 in strip till. So the thing is, what happened in 2014? It did well in 2012, it did well in 2013, and then in 2014, that no-till basically fell apart. So one of the things I want to do is go back and look at that cover crop data. I thought that cover crop data could give me some clues to what happened. So let's take a look at this. Now, this is cover crop high mass, species composition, and CDN ratio. And I'll explain what these mean. So, and this is averaged over the 20, I'm sorry, 2013 with 2014. So the first thing I was interested in was the biomass. Why biomass? Of course, if you have greater cover crop biomass, it means it suppress the weeds better and for a longer period of time. We did see an increase. Any difference in that biomass? So that wasn't a contributing factor. The next thing I want to look at, percentage of that cover crop residue that was right. The reason why I was interested in that is we know legumes break down much faster than those grass cover crop. So no. Higher percentage of rye, it means that, that cover crop residue should remain on that surface for a longer period of time. You should get longer, better weed suppression for a longer period of time. So they saw about a 7% difference, a contributor factor, and also looked at the seed-in ratio. And it's for the same reason. If you have a higher seed-in ratio, it means that residue is going to stay on that surface a little bit longer. You should get a longer period of weed suppression. And we saw like an 8% difference. So those was contribute to that. So the thing is, what sort of triggered this difference is, one of the things I found out is that the rice seeding rate was changed. The rice seeding weight went from 60 pounds per acre to 40 pounds per acre. So I first told him that this could be a contributing factor. They pointed out the fact to me, they said, no, we don't think that's a factor, Saruti. The reason why is because the biomass was the same. Yes, the biomass is going to be the same because if you can reduce the seeding rate of a grass cover crop, and what happens? Those remaining plants tiller more, so the remaining plants are larger. So, you, so it makes up for that biomass differences. So again, if you have more seeds out there, the individual plants weigh less. But the thing I remember in was this. When you reduce the seed rate, what happens? You put less seeds on that soil surface, so there's more niche spaces for weeds to germinate. So I think this sort of contributed to that difference, and there may have been other things that contribute to um, why it didn't work as well in 20, 2014. So, of course, we was interested in marketable yield, which is most important. 
Here is those yields, and this is a metric. Drag. Uh, per hectare. So anyway, but see these letters on top here. And if you have a letter that's different, it means that the yield was significantly different. My job or whatever is going to happen. The no-till. Remember, I warned you at the beginning, one of the biggest problems in no-till vegetables is that the yield is always reduced, especially if you're trying to grow a warm season. And that's what we saw here. So this was of no surprise. However, in 2014, it got corrected. It may have been we planted that eggplant a little bit later, so the soil had more time to warm up. It may have been less residue. Spread calcium came back a week. That the weed was greatest in bare ground when no cultivation was done after planting. That means when we didn't throw in that rescue cultivation treatment, we also found high weed density in the crop rows of the script till plot. So the biggest problem with the script till, it wasn't between the rows, it was within the rows. I think we got so many weeds in that row. And it also responded, the pH was a no-till overall, and it it below the mark. So in black plastic plots, the weeds weren't popping up in that mark. Above. It was in between the plots, in between those rows, where there was no up the roots. And then we found that plant growth was slower and yields were lower. Well, not able to take up. Interesting thing was the quality of the eggplant fruit was best in the strip till plots. Also didn't show any sweet corn data for time constraint, but we also found that sweet corn yield was also significantly higher in the strip till plot treatment. So basically what we found is that the, it's the characteristics of the cover crop residue is key for managing weeds in no-till and strip-till situation. Having the best cover crop, the best amount of biomass, that high seed-in ratio is going to work best. We think we can get better weed suppression in that script tier and no tier plots if we could find a way to make that reservoir <laughs> that soil surface. Nitrogen. But the other one, because eventually it breaks down, and as soon as it breaks down, so there are a few places that it. Will. So we say more research is yeah. addition cropping system, and the reason I said that, when we followed up with two poorly competitive crops. There are some crops. I wasn't just looking to compare a sweet plant where this system may even do terrible in. Some really high competitive crops, something like snap beans or lima beans, where this system may work really well in those because they only need a little bit of help. So one of the things we like to do is improve this strip till method. And you say, well, why do you want to improve that strip till method? No till work best. Why don't you work on that? Well, the thing is about strip till is that I also use a lot of strip tilling as part of my entomology. entomology. And what I find is in this strip till situation, especially well, if you can leave some cover crops in between those crop rows, you get the best insect suppression. I tell you to do. For a couple of reasons in some instances. In some instances, you have less insects colonizing a plot if it's surrounded by non-host plants. The second thing is we get a build up of natural enemies in the cover crop. And those natural enemies will move in into that cash crop. So because of that, I want to improve that strip till system because I think you can get more services out of strip till versus no till if you think about when you think about all the potential pests that can um attack a um crop. So one of the things I talked about earlier was integrated weed management, right? I talked about throwing as many tools out there as possible. So that's the tool that's missing in this strip till. We use the flare mold, we use cover crop and strip till. That missing piece of the puzzle is chemical. I think we have to bring in chemical in part of this operation. Now I can say there was, there was a problem with the strip till method, the way we utilize it. So one of the things, the effect. notice the strip till was done just prior to planting that vegetable crop. The other thing is they actually strip till it twice. So basically what they did was they went in the strip till, then they put the fertilizer in there, and then they strip till again basically to incorporate that fertilizer. Major mistake. Major yeah. mistake. Because what happens when you strip till? You just disturb that seed bed, right? So now you're causing weeds to germinate. Not only did you disturb the seed bed, you just fertilize that seed bed. So what I say, you don't do that in the future. In the future, you yeah. that strip till. You don't apply that fertilizer until you actually plant that crop so that the crop takes it up and not the weeds. Because again, you don't want to feed the weeds to fertilizer. Breaker. And because we get that flush of weed after we strip till, I say you strip till two to three weeks before you plant that crop. Right? 
then let those weeds flush. Let the weeds come up. And that's when you come in and you spray. And you use a bandit spray. That Get a is only 10, inch, 10 inches wide. So you have an amount of herbicide that you have to apply maybe by 75% or more. A representative of what a lot of our once you Once you spray that flush of weeds, you shouldn't get a second flush of weed, hopefully, if you don't destroy the soil again. So then you plant your crop, you plant it with as limited soil disturbance as you possibly can. And the idea left you may get a second weed flush, but what you're hoping is, before you get that second weed flush, that canopy is gonna be closed. So then, if they don't get established before that canopy closed, they're not gonna get established. And then your afterwards, so maybe be, instead of trying to use organic herbicides, you may want to go in with a flamer, whether it's a backpack flamer or whether this is a flamer that's, that has a hooked on some equipment. You may substitute a flamer um, for herbicide spray. The other thing we want to do is we want to replace this. Up to now, we've been using annual winter cover crops, basically die off. So we want to replace that. We want to go with something like a perennial biennial cover crop. So why would we want to do that? Well, the problem is, is that this residue between the rows, eventually it breaks down. And sometimes you can't control when it's going to break down. And when it breaks down, if you have weeds start to pop out of this area. But if we can go with a perennial cover crop that lives the entire duration of that crop cycle, then we can basically keep those, those weeds suppressed the entire season. It's a little tricky because you have to use a low growing cover crop. So the idea if we can use something like red clover, we can grow it really early in the season, just fix through fig stock. It's gonna stay low. Second application about fig stock. The idea is once you plant that vegetable crop for nitrogen fertility, that vegetable crop should be tall enough to take it out. And the other thing is no till. How do we get that residue to last longer in no-till? Well, prior to this time, prior to this year, we've been working on the flare mower, and the flare mower works very well. It's ready. It chops it up in nice little pieces. It spreads it all evenly over the plot, so it does a good job. But hap what happens when you chop those cover crops into really small pieces? They break down really fast. They break down really fast. Or, we use something like a roller crimper. Yes, sir. It's a root and patch. It just rolls it over. The time it was heading, so that means it should last much longer into the season. So this is a way we can kind of improve on that no-till. So now I go back to the title of the presentation. And what was that title? Can we do away with tillage for managing Dang. weeds and vegetables? Thought, hey, we're not. We need all those tools. No matter what fault we have in those tools, we need them because those tools are going to be good in certain situations better than others. Zero to four and zero to 12. And that's all I have. Are there any questions? Ah, this Has anybody tried, <coughs> have you tried, uh, no telling? The question has, have I tried or has anyone tried no-till potatoes? Because that's your typical, you got to till crop, right? Yeah, to my knowledge, I've never seen any research where anyone has tried to do no-till potatoes. Is it lunchtime yet? No one wants to ask questions before lunchtime. <laughs> But I tell you, it's the worst position is to be the speaker after lunch. <laughs> everyone is asleep. 